Hello, Einstein fans. Uh, welcome to another Einstein live stream. I'm Anthony. I manage the Einstein social media accounts. Uh, I'm actually from. I'm actually behind the camera. So, hello, Facebook, uh, okay. and also uh, hello to our uh, Periscope audience. Uh, this is the first time we're streaming on Periscope. So, uh, Periscope fans, hit up that uh, heart uh, like crazy. We're really excited to do this live stream. Today we're live at the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria, Queens, which is a true gem here in uh, New York. Uh, it, everything that you could possibly imagine with respect to the history of cinema, it's it's here. Uh, just uh, come up, come on by and visit. And we're really excited to have a conversation about Einstein's connection with the film industry. So joining us, uh, we have Sonia Epstein to your right, who is the executive uh, editor for Science and Film here at the Museum of the Moving Image. Uh, to the left is uh, David Schwartz. He is the chief curator of the museum, and both of them will be talking about Einstein's connection to the film industry. So, guys, take it away. Okay. All right. Uh, so, hello. To start off, uh, the most interesting depiction that I've seen so far in film is in Nicholas Rogue's 1985 feature film, Insignificance. Mm -hmm. To set the scene a little bit, uh, just <laughs> Teresa Russell is Marilyn Monroe. Here's a still from the film. Uh, Michael Emile is Albert Einstein. Tony Curtis is Joe McCarthy. And Gary Busey is Joe DiMaggio. Einstein is in New York for a peace conference. It's night, and Joe McCarthy is trying to persuade him to testify before a House Committee on Communist Activity. Uh, Einstein, as you may know, is a famous pacifist, and uh, he was resistant to uh, testifying when um, Marilyn Monroe, pursued by Joe DiMaggio, who in real life actually was her husband at one point, kind of bursts onto the scene and persuades Einstein to let her spend the night. Uh, critic Chuck Stevens said Rogue was interested in celebrity and circumstance, and in the now and the then, I'm curious, David, why do you think Rogue chose to bring these particular people together? I think yeah. he was just um, drawn by this idea that these people who were so famous, I mean, Einstein, was certainly the most uh, famous scientist of the 20th century, so it was really unusual for a scientist to have that much celebrity. And, uh, just the idea that on this hot night in New York, when Marilyn Monroe is filming the, uh, the, the scene where her skirt blows up from Some Like It Hot, uh, that, that's the, the conceit of the film, is she's filming that scene, and Einstein is in a hotel, and Joe McCarthy's in town trying to drum up um, people to testify, and, uh, and Joe DiMaggio is lurking about, uh, jealous at all these men looking at his, at his wife, um, then what would happen if they came together? And what would it be like if you put Marilyn Monroe and Albert Einstein in a, in a hotel room together? So I think he loved that situation. Um, Rogue was, you know, one of the interesting things about Rogue's films is that he loved to jump around in time. You know, so I think some of the, when you think about Einstein and his connection to film, um, Einstein really changed the way that we think about, about time. And he was such a 20th century, an important figure in the 20th century. And I think his, his idea that time could be um, moved around and played with and is not finite is central to what film is all about. So you would think there'd be a very close connection to, to Einstein and film. Um, in fact, there are very few films where Einstein is depicted as a major character. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. Um, I have I write about science and film, and so I've seen a lot of depictions of scientists <laughs> uh, in fiction and films. And I actually found in this uh, depiction that Einstein was actually a very sort of like approachable yeah. character because he's very you know invested in the work that he's doing. Like he's trying to do calculations throughout this whole evening. He has this chalkboard and stuff, but at the same time he's kind of like succumbing to the wilds of Marilyn Monroe, yeah. so to speak, as you can imagine that anybody would in that situation. <laughs> uh, and at one point he's even, there's a famous scene where he's sort of literally caught with his pants down, mm -hmm. um, which I found funny, so mm -hmm. if you haven't seen the film, you definitely should. <laughs> so I'm, ju uh, I'm just gonna pause for uh, very quickly because yeah. I'm getting uh, some uh, feedback from our Facebook fans that they're not getting any audio, so I'm just gonna switch the orientation. Okay. Uh, Einstein fans, if you happen to if you can hear better, just, just let us know. I think it should be much better now. Okay. Okay. Um, 
So we were just talking about Albert Einstein uh, and Nicholas Rogue's 1985 feature film, Insignificance. And I was just saying how he was a very kind of relatable character. Uh, anyway, I'm, uh, I'm curious how you see just like how Rogue depicts Einstein. In well, Michael Emil gives a very realistic uh, feeling performance, but I think yeah. you're right. I think it's, it's daunting, the idea of, for an actor to play Einstein. Einstein was a large than life figure. He was instantly recognizable. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, we'll talk later about his friendship with Charlie Chaplin. Like, these are two of the most recognizable people in the world um, at the time. So it, it would be hard to do justice to Einstein. I mean, for, for an actor to play Einstein. You know, Walter Matthau played Einstein in a kind of charming romantic comedy called uh, called IQ, I think yeah. in 1984, with Tim Robbins and Meg Ryan, yeah. and he's sort of helping, uh, Tim Robbins is a, is a car mechanic, and he wants to woo Meg Ryan's character, and you, Einstein helps him out by yeah. letting him, teaching him how to fake being a, being a great scientist, so that's sort of a cute movie, and Matthau is charming and cranky and funny as usual yeah but it, it's it will be uh, there, there's a star trek movie where there's a, a holographic representation of einstein but um you know uh, but beyond aside from that um there, there are very few movies that took him on yeah you know? yeah which is interesting I yeah mean, i wouldn't he's is yeah. such a recognizable character yeah and there are a couple other movies uh ai the steven right. spielberg film uh, if there's like this holographic representation of Einstein named Dr. No, who has his like hair and has the accent, you know, knows the answer to every question. And then in, uh, yeah, we mentioned IQ, there is a more straightforward uh, film called Einstein and Eddington, which right. was a BBC. So the standard biopic. Totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Back to the Future, you know. Right. Uh, Doc <laughs> He's like the quintessential bad scientist, basically like has the hair and then has a dog inspired, or who's named Einstein. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm curious, why do you think, do you have any idea as to why there aren't more feature films? I think it's it's hard. I mean, there was there was a project in the works in, I think it, in, in the 80s, there was a, like an Einstein bio film that was in the works. I think it was just going to be probably too extensive. And, and it, you know, I think, I think, uh, the question of how do you how do you make a movie that's as exciting and dramatic as the real life story? I don't yeah. think they figured out how to dramatize it. I mean, Einstein had sort of a troubled personal life, you know, troubled marriages. But yeah. More interesting things about him, but um, I think it was just hard to do anything in fiction that could like you know match what was what his story was in real life. Yeah, he was also a theoretician, so I yeah. actually think that like dramatizing <laughs> him writing on like a chalkboard is not that interesting so yeah. um just from like a science perspective mm -hmm. that's also uh yeah. yeah he wasn't doing experiments in a lab and yeah uh, yeah so he um appeared on film it, it, it's actually very rare that he even appeared on screen hmm. uh, but there was a movie that was made for the world's fair in 1939 called leaders I think it was called Leaders on World Peace. Yeah. And uh, it was basically like a half hour film where different uh, people from different walks of life, scientists and politicians and authors uh, did a sort of plea for world peace. This was like right as war was breaking out. Huh. So Einstein, he actually had an idea that was sort of a precursor to the United Nations. He felt that there needed to be some unified uh, governing body that would unite all the countries and the countries would have to to follow, so he was advocating for that hmm. um, in that film, um, and he and he also felt there needed to be some sort of military force that was, you know, among countries, I guess, uh, somewhat similar to to, to something like like NATO. I yeah. guess. So uh, so that film was actually seen by uh, millions of people because it played repeatedly at the World's Fair. In '39, yeah. so uh, so that was a notable appearance on screen for him. Yeah, but that was that was one of the few times that he was actually filmed. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Yeah. There there is this famous photograph uh, <laughs> you guys may have seen. It's of Einstein and Chaplin and Einstein's second wife Elsa, who was also his first cousin, uh, and.
David, can you tell, what do we know about this? Well, so Einstein came to California in 1931. He was on a research trip, basically, but he was in the heart of Hollywood. So he arranged for a tour of the Universal Studio, and he went to the Warner Brothers lot. I think there's a famous picture of him riding a bicycle on the back lot at Warner Brothers. And while he was there, he met Charlie Chaplin. So Chaplin, of course, was the most famous person in Hollywood at that time. There is a story that he also met Mary Pickford at the time. Pickford was very excited because she thought she was meeting Sergei Eisenstein, the Russian filmmaker, who was also doing some forays into Hollywood. So she was a little let down that he wasn't a film director. But Chaplin was very interested in Einstein and they became friends. Chaplin invited him over for a dinner party, and they sort of struck off a friendship. I think Chaplin was 16 years old at the time, quite young. So she just found Einstein to be this sort of interesting old guy. He was probably 50 at the time. And then the picture that we're looking at here was at the premiere of City Lights, which is Chaplin's masterpiece. It's a great movie that came out in 1931. And so Charlie invited his pal, Albert Einstein, to come with him. And it must have been quite a sight, the two of them just walking down the street. Einstein said that everybody was fascinated with Chaplin because everybody could understand Chaplin, and they're fascinated with him because they couldn't understand him at all. So that was sort of a funny idea. Yeah, I think it says something about how maybe lonely celebrity is in some ways. They kind of bonded in this over not being known, but then... Well, they were interested in each other. They were interested in... The one passion, what Chaplin's wife said was that they actually didn't... They had a little trouble figuring out what to talk about, but the one thing that they had in common was a love for music. Chaplin was writing music for his own films and considered himself a composer. Well, he was a composer. So they loved to talk about music. That's the one subject they really enjoyed talking about. Yeah, because City Lights was actually done when sound was available to be done. Sound was available, but Chaplin made that in pantomime. So it was basically made with music and sound effects, which is also how Chaplin made Modern Times, which was done five years later. And they did remain friends for a while and go to dinner parties and things like that. There is also one other picture that you guys may have seen that's of Chaplin... No, I'm sorry, Einstein and Elsa on a studio set to drive a car. And it's kind of funny because some of you may know, but Einstein actually never drove in real life. Though he did sail. He was famously a very bad sailor. He actually couldn't even swim. And he had to get rescued a number of times. But it actually was also on a sailboat that he wrote his famous letter to President Roosevelt about starting... It kind of led to the start of the Manhattan Project. Yeah, he suggested... Right, he, of course... I mean, this is one of the great ironies about Einstein is that he advanced our understanding of science so much, but also his theories led to the development of the atom bomb. You know, so it's like all of these things sort of explain why he was... Why Time Magazine chose him as the person of the century, you know, as the most important figure of the 20th century. You know, it was... Not only did he change our understanding of the way the world works and our understanding... It was... It really went beyond an understanding of time, I think. And I think what his theories led to was this idea that identity itself... That nothing is really solid, that everything is relative. In a way, that I think is an underlying idea. And, you know, you can find a link between cubist art and Einstein's theories and Freud's concept of identity. I mean, a lot of... So much of culture and understanding in the 20th century grew out of Einstein's views. So I think he just, like, broke down the way that people thought about themselves and understood the world. And then, of course, 
the atom bomb was was like the defining you know sort of crisis and an existential threat yeah. of this of the century and we're still sort of dealing dealing with it now yeah <laughs> yep. as we you know every four years we decide who's going to control the the uh the code the nuclear codes yeah. so we have to thank for that <laughs> terror <laughs> that we have confront yeah right <laughs> So I just want to say, if you guys are just joining us, I am Sonia Epstein, executive editor of scienceandfilm.org, and I'm here at the Museum of Moving Image speaking with our chief curator, David Schwartz, about Einstein and film. Uh, one of the things that our viewers may not know about Einstein is that he actually invented one of the first automatic cameras, meaning that it had a self-adjusting aperture and lens, and he took out a patent for it with Gustav Bucky in 1936. You might be able to see, but we have a lot of old camera technologies mm -hmm. here at the museum, and you've really been here since the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty much as old as some of the cameras. Yeah. So we have, I think we're in the uh, section with newsreel cameras. We actually have um, a model camera that Robert Flaherty used to make the Nook of the North. Yeah. And right behind me is a, a, a new and technically newsreel camera that actually has sound recording um, app, you know, equipment on it, so you can record. It was perfect for newsreel cameramen huh. to record picture and sound at the same time. Yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of um, technical equipment at the museum. Uh, as we show the process, we're in the process of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. So that's something you can explore in the exhibitions. Yeah, so I'm just yeah. curious, was that part of the original concept for the museum? It always was. It I mean, we are, uh, we're located the street from the Astoria Studios, yeah. which is uh, you know one of the first and, and biggest uh, movie studios on the East Coast. Um, it was built in 1920 by Paramount. So we've always been interested in the process of filmmaking. Um, so we in our, we don't actually collect films. We collect everything except for the film. So we collect technical yeah. equipment and production material and posters and costumes and things like that. But we're really interested in the process. Okay, so I think we have time for some questions. We've been getting some questions, and by the way, I know that there have been some people saying that the audio is quite low. I think uh, adjusting it this way has been better. So I hope that everybody's been able to hear this amazing conversation. But the one question we've been getting a lot is, um, a lot of the, the scientific uh, notions that we see in you know, sci-fi films with respect to tra time travel have some connection and bearing to Einstein's theory of special relativity. Sure. How accurate is the science? <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. I think that um, I mean, in terms of, of the the re the reality of time travel, you know, what what I think Einstein showed is that it's possible to travel forward in time at different rates. I mean, he basically, you know, his his discovery in terms of relativity was that if you as you approach the speed of light, your experience of time can slow down. So you, you can move into the future at a slower rate. So that means that conceivably it's possible to travel forward in time. And then uh, um, I, I think to me the movie that really uh, engages most with the actual science is Interstellar. Mm -hmm. I'm curious yeah. if, you, if you agree with that. But I think, you know, the idea that um, Matthew McConaughey's character is travels uh, approaching the speed of light and is and um, everybody on planet Earth ages considerably while he is on a mission to find um, an alternative planet where civilization can move to uh, is is you know it really tries to stay true. I think that's a movie where there were science consultants and they tried to visualize things um, in accordance with with Einstein's theories. So, you know, one of the, one of the great um, concepts that Einstein developed that movie makers have been drawn to is the idea of the wormhole. Mm -hmm. That there is, you know, there can be a place in the universe where you can sort of enter um, what's called a wormhole and it sort of instantly wind up in a different part of the universe. So it's a, it's a convenient tool for <laughs> intergalactic travel. I mean, I, and, and I think Einstein showed that it, is conceivably possible that there could be a wormhole. I think Interstellar tried to actually use his his formulas and his science to show what a wormhole could possibly look like. Yeah. I mean, I think most scientists understand that, that 
it would really be impossible for humans to survive that voyage. So it's highly unlikely that scientists will be going into wormholes and coming out in some other place in the universe. But it is conceivable that there are wormholes out there. We'll probably never know. Hopefully. You'll be around longer than me. Maybe you'll find out. I'll let you guys know. Yeah, that... You can't travel back. I mean, the idea that you can travel back in time is pretty much... Right. That's like, there has to be a different... Einstein talked about streams of time, and I think there actually is a physicist named Michio Kaku who speaks about the film Back to the Future. And on Science and Film, I actually posted a clip where you can see him talking about how realistic it is. And yes, it's much more difficult to travel backward in time. And for Interstellar, they did consult this physicist. I would say it's impossible. Or impossible. I don't want to disillusion anybody. He says, like, it's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things I like about Einstein, and it's actually depicted in this movie, Insignificance, was that, of course, he was a mathematician. But he often came to his theories through visualization. He would imagine these different scenarios with trains and elevators. And I never could really understand this because I'm not smart enough. But he would... But actually, in the movie Insignificance, Marilyn Monroe has... There's this scene where her character does this physical demonstration of the theory of relativity. And it's a visualization. And so there was something kind of cinematic about that, that Einstein would sort of come up with these scenarios. He would visualize them. And then he would come up with the math to support the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great clip. It's an eight-minute clip, and I will be posting it on scienceandfilm.org. And yeah, as you know, Einstein was a theoretician, so... But he was visual. And of course, he did have a love for music that we talked about. So he was sort of interested in the other arts, and he often talked about the power of imagination. He was inspirational that way. And by the way, for anybody who has any questions relating to the topic of Einstein and film, keep them coming in the comments section. And also, I've tagged Science and Film in the title of the Facebook Live. And also, you could check them out at scienceandfilm.org. One question that I got from John Jones, he asked on Facebook, why is it that people opt for the stereotype of mad scientist or genius when it comes to Einstein? You know, why is that automatic? Is it... Well, look at his hair. I mean, I think... I don't know if they so much think of him as a mad scientist, but there was something sort of endearing about his... just the way he looked. He seemed to be somebody who didn't care that much about appearance. I think there was this idea that he's so wrapped up in his ideas that he doesn't really take care of himself. And, you know, so doesn't really pay much attention to how he dresses. But there was something about the image. You know, we talk about why Charlie Chaplin was so famous. You know, you think of Chaplin, you instantly visualize the tramp character. And I think with Einstein, you know, I think people just instantly visualize him. And I'm not sure how much he cultivated that, but I think it was just, you know, he really... I mean, he came up with the theory relatively relatively in 1905, I believe. And then it really took a while until he... until the Nobel Committee, like, really fully accepted that and gave him the prize. And it took a while for his fame to really build, but, yeah, but he was enormously famous. And I think people just, you know, he... There was something sort of charismatic about the way he looked. It was just his his style. And he also had there's that famous photograph of him sticking his tongue sticking out, his tongue out, which I think you know gave a sense of his. I think there was always a sense of childlikeness with yeah. him that he was playful. Yeah. You know, I think that photograph where he's sticking his tongue out, he was like a little tired of smiling for yeah. photographs. Mm-hmm. He was like posing for photos that day and like smiled one too many times, and then he just stuck out his tongue. Yeah. But that image like sticks with us. Like if you think of Einstein, you think of that. Yeah. So I think it's uh, something that like, kids would relate to, you know, who are mm-hmm. getting interested in science. The idea that you have this like childlike sense of wonder, but you know, at the root of the enormous like hard work, work and, and boring work of being a great mathematician. Yeah. Uh, one other question we got on Periscope is: if there was one aspect of Einstein's biographical life that you wish was depicted, what would it be? Hmm. Uh, well, I. Um... 
What I haven't seen so far is uh, something about his relationships with his wives, specifically his first wife, Maleva. She was actually a physicist, um, and they collaborated a lot when they first got together. And um, yeah. you know, she she was you know had her own studies. She was the only woman in the physics class. And yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah. she sort of popped out at him, and and um, the, the 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 there it wasn't a movie, but Alan Alda did a theatrical production yes. a few years ago, which uses the letters between Einstein and, I don't I believe her, yeah. yeah. And it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of dirt there on Einstein that comes out. I mean, he was, he was like, you know, romantic and, and aloof and un, unfaithful and, you know, a sort of difficult person in a lot yeah. of ways. So that comes out in the letter. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, but, yeah. Uh, we'll wrap it up with uh, one more question, which is uh, with respect to uh, Einstein's uh, various depictions. You were touching on IQ and uh, you know Back to the Future and a very various amount of other uh, depictions. Which one do you think has been the most accurate depiction in Hollywood of Einstein? Oh, I mean, I think the Nicholas Roeg film yeah. is the one that feels the most accurate. I mean, I think it was. Uh, but there's, it's not, again, there's not a lot to choose from among these different depictions. I mean, I guess, I, I didn't see that HBO movie, um, Einstein and Eddington. I don't yeah. know, that, that might be realistic, but um, okay. So I wish we had more time. I was going to do my explanation of the general. Oh, please, yeah, if, if, if you, if you want to give a crack at it. Um, I'd love to, but I think we're out of time. So. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. perhaps that could be a great blog post for scienceandfilm.org. So. Yeah, I'll tweet yeah. that out. <laughs> well, anyway, David, Sonia, thank you very much for uh, doing this Facebook Live and Periscope stream. Uh, once again, uh, you can uh, check them out at scienceandfilm.org. We've also tagged them here on this Facebook stream. And also, uh, if you are in Queens, uh, definitely pay a visit to the Museum of the Moving Image. It's a real gem here in uh, 